everyone, and welcome to Book Break. Today, I have my fellow librarian, Jenna, here with me, and Hello. we are going to do our best of 2023 reads. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, me too. We can kind of talk about, you know, a little bit. Do you make goals for yourself and everything for when you read? Or? No. No? Uh, oh. uh, you know, I set a general goal for the year. Um, very low. Okay. As to not disappoint myself. Yeah. yeah. I set mine low and then I kept bumping it up because I had a banner year this year. So. How many? A uh, hundred and six. Holy crap. I have been trying to do a hundred for like several years now. Oh, I so. think I read 37. So yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> that's still pretty me. good. But um, maybe it says how pathetic my life actually is. No, mm. I think I did a lot of traveling and I did a lot of audiobooks. And now I pretty much do that now all the Mm -hmm. time when I'm in the car. So that helped. But um, yeah, most of my books fit in like emotional, mysterious, and top genres for me were mystery, literary fiction, and historical. And fantasy is rising up the ranks. Thanks to you and I did that cozy fantasy, I think. We did. So. I um, read emotional, big one for me. Um, Lighthearted was also a big one. Okay. And then dark was the third biggest one. <laughs> so that, that's kind of good. A it's, little contradictory, but um, but I think the darkness is the fantasy that I all read. You know, some dark academia type stuff. Right. Um, I did read purely fiction. Okay. And my top three categories were romance, fantasy, and contemporary. All right. So yeah, I mostly read all fiction. Yeah. I, I think I was like maybe ten or eleven percent nonfiction. So trying to read a little bit more. I mostly like memoirs, though. Nothing real. Nothing real. And some crew tr- true crime. So, do cookbooks count? I don't even put cookbooks in my account. That's my. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, I love cookbooks. Yeah. So you're probably at 200 with cookbooks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So my favorite thing I think I discovered this year was the mythology retelling and the cozy fantasy. I think that was like the two things that really surprised me. Yeah, cozy so. fantasy was big for me. Yeah, I wasn't surprised, but cozy fantasy was kind of the gateway drug for mm-hmm. me into like actual like deep fantasy with lore and stuff wor- a lot of world building right um so I was surprised by that yeah I didn't see that coming huh okay well my first one is like one of my standard things that I always like it's a historical fiction and it's called the frozen river by Ariel Lahan and this one came out pretty late in the year come it came out this month I actually got to read it a little bit early I on that galley mm-hmm. so I've been waiting to talk about this one but it is historical and it's a mystery and it's based on the life and diary of a lady named Martha Ballard who was an 18th century midwife in Maine and she's called to investigate when a man is found his body is found frozen in the Kennebec River and so she's kind of summoned as the midwife to determine like cause of death or anything remote so when she sees this man she really thinks that he didn't drown that it was a murder because she sees like you know marks around his neck and different things so she's really concerned about this and to make it even more mysterious, there was um, an accused sexual assault in the town by the pastor's wife, and this was one of the men. Oh. So um, Martha thinks that these two events are related sure. and come to find out there's some powerful forces in the town that are trying to suppress the truth. So um, it was very good. The only thing is there were like multiple sexual assaults in this book so i would say if that's a trigger or anything for you or you're sensitive about that you know this probably is not the book for you but um it it's an interesting look at the way the trial and the judicial system ran and you know this This you know 17 yeah 1700s Mm -hmm. um in maine so a lot of prejudices a lot of it was nice because she was a strong female character, but she did, you know, not everybody gave her the respect that she deserved. But, yeah, it was really, really good. Kept okay. me kept me engrossed the entire time. Great. So Yeah. Okay. Um, my first one is Fourth Wing, and um, you've also read this and enjoyed it. Yes, I um, did. I will try to keep the sequel to this Iron Flame out of my... <laughs> Out of my current rating for Fourth Wing. Um, So feel free to chime in here if you have thoughts or opinions. Um, Fourth Wing, if you don't know, came out in March, and it kind of took the 
fantasy world by storm. Oh, it took um, the whole internet by storm. Yeah, a little. And yeah. and um, I read it and thinking, what's the big deal? And when I first started it, I couldn't put it down. And it was one of those books that I thought about forever. Essentially, um, it's a whole fantasy world, a place called Navarre. Um, Violet Storingale is the main character in her early 20s. Um, and she is living in this world where there are quadrants of people and or jobs, four different jobs that you can have in this world. So you can be a scribe, kind of like an archivist, um, infantry, you know, military healers, which just helped heal hurt people, <laughs> or writers or dragon writers. And she has been training her whole life to be a scribe and thinking she's going to leave this nice, quiet life in the archives. Um, and her mother, the general of the entire army, is forcing her to be a dragon writer. So, of course... She's this small, weak girl who is now trying to survive and ride dragons. Um, and, of course, there's romance and all sorts of things like that in there. Um, and she discovers that her mother's lying about quite a lot of things. And um, it's pretty dramatic. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing. What I liked about this is that Violet, while she admits to being weak and incapable... She doesn't wallow in her weakness, which I find most female main characters do. That bothers me. She did not. Um, I also love the dragons. Oh, I love the dragons. The dragons they, were super cool. Yes. And the dragons in this book, it's like the dragons will pick you to bond. Correct. So not everyone that goes into that dragon rider quadrant Gets a dragon. out to get a dragon. Right. It's a process. And right. it's, a lot of people die getting their dragon, right? So when you are chosen to be bonded, it's a pretty big deal. And they can communicate mentally so you can hear the dragons through her perspective, um, which they're actually really funny. A lot of the time they're sarcastic and quippy and um, they add a lot to the story. And I really appreciated that. Yeah. It kind of reminded me a little bit of like the Hunger Games a little bit with... Yes. Um, it's like... Hunger Games and uh, Sarah J. Moss books combined. Right. Is yeah. it ceremonial like The Giver? Where it's like all this grand... A little bit. Fanfare, yeah. Yeah, because actually it's it's got a dark academia too. Because yes, I did want to say that. Anything yeah. with an academy, I'm in. Okay. Yeah. So she, it was a little like Harry Potter in that sense. They have to go through this school process. Mm -hmm. Um. So, yeah, there is some big government part of it, like war. It's, it's, I don't know. I don't know how else to explain it. Yeah. It had some YA themes to me, but it's definitely oh, more adult. It is adult, technically adult fiction. In the, um, in the romance or whatever. Right. So. Romanticy. Romanticy. <laughs> <laughs> it's my number one category. Okay. Yeah. And we won't go into the, the second one We will one not yet. discuss Iron Flame. No. Maybe at a later date. Because <laughs> <laughs> we both have a lot of thoughts we'll about that We'll leave you one. on that cliffhanger. Yeah. So my second one was another oops, another sorry. book about a body in a river. Can't Ir wait. <laughs> Ironically, this must be my, my theme. It's really and this, up the year. Yeah, this one is called The River We Remember by William Kent Kruger. And... This one is also historical, also a mystery, set in 1958 in a small Minnesota town where one of its most powerful citizens is found dead in the river on Memorial Day. Mm. Um, only he's dead from a shotgun blast, so it's pretty apparent pretty that murder, yeah. you know he didn't jump in there on his own. So um, mm. the investigation falls to Sheriff Brody Dern, who is a decorated war hero, but he's still struggling with a lot of physical and emotional scars from his military service. Um, they are circulating rumors in the town. There, there was a Native American that also served in the war, and he has a Japanese wife. So there's a lot of both anti-American and anti-Japanese sentiment. So when this man is found dead... This is the first thing the townspeople of course. try to pin it on. His name is Noah Bluestone. So Brody is really trying to figure out the truth of this and what happened. He makes some questionable decisions in his investigation, um, but you learn about just William Ken Kruger can really capture the dynamics of a small town. I've read several books by him now, and he's gotten to be like almost everything I've read I've really liked. And that's part of the reason why he, he usually always has Native American characters from that 
portion of you know the upper the, the northwest or, oh, that or space. like east minnesota so not northwest um and they all have usually some tragic secret or something and there's always a mystery involved so if any of those are keywords that are your jam that i, I highly suggest jumping into william kent kruger and this one he does have a series this one is not in a series so it is a standalone which is nice so you could just kind of dip your toes in and figure out if you like this author you know okay but yeah it's one of my favorite ones from this year the river we remember and I think that's it for me with the dead, with bodies, dead bodies in the rivers. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's not it for me with romance because I'm moving on to Emily Henry, who I love and adore and have, she holds a very special place in my heart and mind. Um, this is Happy Place by Emily Henry. It came out in the spring. Again, not a very um, niche read. This is a pretty standard popular book. Um, it's about Harriet and Wen. They're in their thirties. They've been a couple since college. They're perfect like the stable couple of their friend group um except now they are broken up and they won't discuss it and they haven't told anyone in their family or their friends that they've broken up and now they are having to pretend that they're still together at their annual summer get together um which does lead to some hilarious things and also some pretty depressing moments Mm -hmm. um Harriet herself is struggling with her career and her life doesn't know where she wants to go um and she struggles with a lot of self-doubt and unsureness and I listened to a podcast that Emily Henry was on and she said that um Harriet had millennial ennui and that phrase has really stuck with me and I'm like because I think I have millennial ennui you know it's like we all get it we all saw a lot of tragedies um, and are just living our lives. Um, so it felt kind of personal to me in that way. But Emily Henry is wonderful. She writes women and female friendships so well to me. Um, and also found family and friends mm-hmm. are her top, some of her top skills. I like her banter. She can write some really she funny does write great banter. Communication. You know. Yeah. Um, She's witty. Yes. Extremely. She's witty. So, um, you know, if you like romance and also some introspection about yourself and where you are in your life can we sneak in that she's her next one and coming out next year is <gasps> yes set, we can yes it's a, a library the is main character is a children's librarian so if i thought this one was pretty personal i think yeah, the other one I think might we're all going to be bending really down in homage that. to uh-huh. emily henry on that one i can't one. wait it's called funny story i think it comes out yeah in the summer maybe spring it's spring or summer mm-hmm. yeah we'll keep can't you wait. posted but um Yeah, my next one I'm not going to talk too much about because I've talked a little bit about it before. And it was The Unmaking of June Farrell by Adrienne Young. And Mm -hmm. this one was another kind of a romanticy, not not so much as deep fantasy, but it has the time travel magic kind of setting, which I really like. Set, of course, in North Carolina, this southern setting that's always my jam. Mm -hmm. Um, June Farrow is belongs to a family that owns a gorgeous flower farm that supplies a lot of people weddings. But in addition to their magical flowers, they also have a curse where they seem to get almost like an Alzheimer's or dementia type thing, Ooh. according to the people in the town. But um, so when her grandmother dies, June has been starting to already hear voices and different things. So she's concerned she's getting like an early dose of this curse. But what it actually is, is she's seeing opportunities to go back in the future. And she gets an envelope from her grandmother after her grandmother passes away with a photograph of her mother and a man that was very prominent in the town, like several decades before her mother should have known him. And he was murdered. So there's some time travel. Yes. So there's definitely time travel. Um, Very cryptic clues. And of course, there's going to be a romance when she goes back in time. And then a a decision will have to be made. So I don't want to spoil it with the decision. But if you like romance, time travel, the South, um, I highly recommend The Unmaking of June Farrow. I have your copy of that book in my home. And I haven't started to read it yet. I'll be fully honest. It's up there. It's on my next, on my next list. Now that I finished Iron Flame. Yes. Okay. The next book I want to talk about is In the Lives of Puppets by T.J. Klune. Now just some fun 
fun facts here. This came out the same week as Happy Place. Oh my gosh. Um, probably within, I think it was within the same couple of days. That was a really good week for me. <laughs> um, I don't think I did anything but read these two books. Um, T.J. Klune, if you're unfamiliar, writes Cozy Fantasy. He wrote The House by the Cerulean Sea. And, um, Under the Whispering Under Door. Under the Whispering Door, which I think I talked about on my first podcast with yes. you. I can't quite remember. But um, this one is kind of a robotic fantasy. Okay. Or more like um, apocalyptic robotic fantasy. So there's a strange little home in the beginning of the story and just basically a bunch of tree houses. Okay. There are three robots and one human. Giovanni Lawson, which is based off Pinocchio, um, is the father robot. There's a little nurse machine who is hilarious, sarcastic, and slightly sadistic. And then there is a little vacuum machine, kind of like a Roomba, that's what I picture, (laughs) who is um, really unsure about everything and desperate for love and attention. And then the human, Victor Lawson, who's just a human, um, living with these three robots, accepts it as his life. And they're just happy and safe and alone. And he never questions it um, until he finds an old robot labeled HAP or HAP, as they call him. And he learns that HAP spent his life hunting humans. Uh oh. But only after he has salvaged this robot to come back to life. And now is dealing with a robot who was programmed to kill humans. Um, so Hap unwittingly alerts the government that killed all the humans that Giovanni is still alive. And they take Giovanni. And now this little family has to go on this journey to bring him back and live with them while Victor is still human and trying to be killed by all these robots. Oh my um, gosh. It's a fun, like, apocalyptic story. It's sort of like Pinocchio and Wally put together. Okay. Um, that's how I picture it. But for adults, it's not for kids. Um, it does a fantastic job. It really, like, the main theme is discovering what it is to be human. And it's really interesting to see Victor come to those conclusions through robots. He's also really good. I like T.J. Klune because he's got the found family very found family down that's his thing and yeah. he's big on um lgbtq representation that's in there as well and um he does a good job at writing about these heavy topics like death or what it is to be human um without feeling sappy or like overwhelming mm-hmm. I really yeah that one's that. definitely on my bookshelf i i yeah. want to read that one it's a good one. Oh gosh it's my turn again yeah um my next one is another one of my favorite authors, um, Anne Patchett, and it is Tom Lake. So this is a story about a woman. Her name is Laura. She has three daughters. It's set during the pandemic, and they have a cherry farm up in mm. Michigan. So all her daughters, I, I'm assuming they're in their 20s or they're young adult women, have all come home due to the pandemic. And while they're picking cherries and doing stuff, they're asking their mother. She had an affair with a now famous actor. He was not famous at that time. Um, They did a summer stock play together, Our Town, and his name was Peter Duke. So their mom had an affair with Peter Duke. So the daughters are kind of like asking her about it and asking her about that time of their life. And, you know, it was also about the time where she met her husband, who is their father. So um, he was also involved in in the play. So it's she writes very good, like, family drama Mm -hmm. and, you know, doesn't make it sappy. And there's always, like, something, like, there is a, a secret at the end, like, the mom only tells so much of the story to the girls, and she does hold one very important thing back. But, um... I really liked it. It was just, you know, it's a quiet book. I don't know how else to explain it. Like, it, you're not jumping up and down. Right, you know. there's something major. Right. Like it's not yeah. major. But you're, you're finding out about people and what draws them together, and you can kind of visualize those kind of relationships that you remember in your own life. So, yeah, it was very good. Tom good. Lake by Ann Patchett. I've never read any Ann Patchett. I'm yeah, and I didn't, I actually read this one, um, like, Again, I had like an advanced copy, so I read this one digitally. But Meryl Streep is the narrator, and I've wow. heard that she does a tremendous job on the audiobook if you like audiobooks. Noted. I will be looking into that. Yeah. So 
Okay. My next one is um, The Seven Year Slip by Ashley Poston. And I think you've read this one as well. I liked this one too. Um, this one, <laughs> the cover is bright yellow. I think I read it in July or August. Wonderful summer read. Um, it's about Clementine. She's in a publishing industry. Again, in her 30s, unsure of where she is with her life, with her job, with her love life. Um, and she likes to keep herself safe and orderly and doesn't want anything to interfere. Um, and she is currently living in her late aunt's apartment. An aunt who she loved, who was just kind of a matriarch to her. Um, and she comes home one day to find a strange man standing in her kitchen and has no idea how he got there. Um, and it turns out that the apartment is magical. And every every so often, when you walk into the apartment, you are seven years in the past. Mm-hmm. It's a time traveling apartment. Um, so this man she meets is seven years in the past. He thinks her aunt is still alive. They're having these discussions and conversations, and she's finding about herself and about. Old, of course, she falls in love with this man seven years in the past, and also dealing with her current life in the present. Um, it was a fun read. Yeah, talks I really, about food a lot. The yeah. the man is a chef. Um, lots of good talks about food, and it doesn't make you hungry. Um, it, it was just a sweet. It was a sweet, en- fun. Like read. you said, it was a perfect summer read. Absolutely, I love that one. Another one I really liked, and I talked about it before, was Clytemnestra, and it really started my diving into the Greek mythology retellings, which I never had before. A lot of people had read Circe, which I've read yeah. since then. Um, and um, The Song of Achilles, did you read that one? I have not read Song of Achilles. That's okay. also Madeline Miller. This mm-hmm. one was by Costanza Cassati. And Clytemnestra, for those of you that don't know, is a legendary queen in the whole Helen of Troy saga. Like, Helen was her sister, but she marries the evil king Agamemnon, who sacrifices their daughter to get good winds so he could go travel to Troy and, you know, kick the Trojans, you know, butt. <laughs> but uh, so she's a woman with vengeance and okay. she waits and waits and waits and you just wait with her as to how she's going to make this man pay for sacrificing her daughter. Oh, and he killed the man that she was married to before. So. Of course. Yeah pretty evil guy but this one was so good so well done and um like i said i've read probably three or four greek mythology retellings now thanks to this book amazing is that the only one the author has written yeah i believe this was a debut wow yeah and um it was a fabulous debut i mean i couldn't you know really well done so okay um I have a couple honorable mentions now. These did not make it into my top books, um, but they're up there. And I I wanted to talk about Divine Rivals. And this is probably, I really struggle. I don't want to put it at my number five top book, but it's not really my number six either. So I guess it's number five with like a little star by it um, because I thought about it a lot. And that's why I have it up there. Um, It wasn't one of those books that I put down and like, all of a sudden the plot goes out of my head. I don't Mm -hmm. know if that happens to you, but sometimes I'll read a book and forget. Oh yeah, totally. Um, This one did not. So I put it at five, I guess, with an asterisk next to it. It is Divine Rivals by Rebecca Ross. This is another internet famous. Okay. um, Like TikTok famous. Yeah. Um, And it's definitely YA. And it's um, a story of two young rival journalists um, during wartime. Um, they're kind of vying against each other for a promotion. And the war is between gods. So it's not civilization's war, which it ultimately is because they're helping these gods, but it's um, two different sides with two different gods that are fighting each other. So there's some magicalness to it. Um, but the main characters have typewriters, of course, because they're journalists. And um, the female main character, and I can't remember her name, and I didn't write it down, so I'm really sorry. I think it's, it's a flower of some kind, Iris maybe, um, has been writing letters to her brother who was off at war. And instead of sending them, because she doesn't know where he is, she just puts them under her closet door and just kind of leaves them. But she notices that they disappear. She doesn't know where they're going. Um, so ultimately she gets sent to the front lines and is continuing to write these letters and finds out that they're going to her rival journalist. Oh. Oh, Yes. 
Um, you know, there's a lot of cutthroat rivalry between these two. There's also the war with the gods going and raging. Um, and it kind of takes an interesting turn between grief, war correspondence, and um, romance. Nice. Enemies to lovers. Okay. Good time. Mm-hmm. Enemies to lovers is always fun. <laughs> this is, yes. So... Do you have any other one? Didn't you like Mame, too? I did like Mame. Yeah. Um, it's literary fiction, Jessica George. Um, and it is about a woman who lives in London, and she's helping her ailing father. Um, and it really is just, again, like a quiet book. You know, nothing outstanding happens. She really is just living her life, taking care of her father, and dealing with some like childhood trauma issues that she has, and is struggling to become her own person after taking care of her father with a mother who doesn't help at all. Um, so she's really just finding out who she is, um, aside from help being a caretaker, and aside from her mother telling her what she should be doing. Um, and it's actually like it's just a simple, beautiful story. That one's a debut novel as well. Okay. Mm-hmm. The only other one I was going to talk about was a nonfiction one, and I just read, and it's not like it's the best nonfiction ever, but I can't stop thinking about it, and it was that Counting the Cost really? by Jill Duggar. Or, you just read that last week, I, and that's I made your top. Yeah, and, um, and like I said, it was just because I felt like I never watched that show what it was it 19 and counting or what I yeah mean, I, but many, i think everyone in america knows who these sure. people are yeah the duggar family right yes yeah. yes but she takes you into kind of what it's taken her to heal and get back to a somewhat normal life and get out from under that i never realized it, it wasn't just a religion it was a it cult. has like four initials. It's some kind of oh the oh oh IBLP or something yes, like that. Yes, yeah. that, um, mm-hmm. yes, that where there was a the main one of the main premises was not besides like you know godly life and long hair and skirts or whatever is the father will have supreme authority like even if you're married like you can be an adult the child women. and he yeah. still He's, has authority over you. Yeah, it's just women, right? Or it's it called the too? institute. In basic life principles. Yeah, there you okay. go. Yeah. Still very prevalent. Yeah. So um, found it very fascinating. So if you like cults or <laughs> that type of, you know, because yeah, basically that's right. kind of what it basically, felt like to me. It's yeah. almost like she's having to deprogram herself. Of so, course. yeah. I wasn't going to bring it up, but I did because I can't stop thinking about it. <laughs> so, but anyway, we hope that something that we have talked about, you know, strikes a chord with you, or if not, you would find something for you to read. And we are only going to be doing this one episode in December. My next episode in the beginning of January, Stephanie and I, who is our fiction buyer, are going to be talking about books we are looking forward to in 2024. Nice. Yeah. So that will be fun. And we hope you all have a great holiday season. And thanks so much for listening. Bye. Bye. Book Break is a production of the Grease Public Library, made possible through the support of the friends of the Grease Public Library. Theme music composed and performed by Sean Greif.